So we are starting a new topic today, oscillations. Uh, so last week we covered, last Tuesday we covered uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. And with that, actually, we have covered everything. We have covered every law of nature that we would cover in this class. There's nothing new that we are covering. The rest of what we are covering is actually applications. It, we are now using you know, what you spent so much time and effort learning. And um, so for, you know, to me, this is actually the fun part of the semester because um, so I, I don't have the demo set up for today, but on Thursday, I'll have a demo set up that, um, oh, I, I can show you this. It's a bigger version of this small, tiny demo. So, I mean, it's not something that we will go over in detail because working out the actual mathematics for this is uh, upper division level material. But uh, this is what's called coupled oscillator. It's coupled in this way. It can oscillate up and down, and it can also uh, oscillate by rotation. And let me just set it in motion and watch, uh, let you watch what happens. So I'm going to move it down and let it go. Starts by moving up and down, and over time, something different happens. And then over time, something different happens again. Um, it's an example of something called a coupled oscillator. Uh, on Thursday, I'll have a actually bigger demo setup that's easier for me to explain than this. So, um, so you know, this is the fun part of the semester. Uh, the, so, anyways, um, any questions before we get started? No. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, so with the oscillations, I you know this is something you have seen before. You have seen me use this Masona spring as a demo for a bunch of different things many times now, right? This is not anything new, right? Right? So um, what we are now going to do today is we are going to spend a little bit more time looking at this in detail. We are going to so you know you have seen you have seen this setup. And we have used this setup to talk about spring force, right? Where you see this mass come to rest. That's the equilibrium position. You can draw the free body diagram. Gravity pulling it down. Spring force pulls it up. It balances it here, right? We have also used this setup to look at conservation of energy. So you know how to answer questions like, if I pull it down by some amount and let go, and somehow I tell you the spring constant, then you can answer the question of how fast is it moving when it comes back to the equilibrium position. Let me mark the equilibrium position, by the way. Uh, I don't, okay. Um, so if I mark the equilibrium position here at the bottom of the mass when it's at rest, more or less, then you can, so from what we have done so far, you can answer questions like that. So if I tell you, okay, I displace it by, I don't know, 20 centimeters, and I tell you the spring constant, and I ask you when I let go, how fast is the mass moving when it reaches the equilibrium position? You can imagine answering that question? Yes, yeah. So this is a setup that we have seen, but um, what we haven't done is really go into a deep dive and really look at it in detail. So you will maybe notice we have never done this. We have never tried to describe the position of this mass as a function of time. Right? Can anyone remember when we tried to describe the position of this mass as a function of time? Have we ever tried that? Why haven't you tried it? It's not as though we haven't done kinematics. So why didn't we do it with this uh, setup that we keep coming back to. Jared, anything about this setup that makes it so that we can use the same method of kinematics that we started out the, this semester with, actually? It's moving up and down. It's oscillatory. And many of the motion that we have analyzed in detail are not oscillatory motion like that. Like we have looked at a cart that's uh, you know, moving at a constant velocity, and we have even looked at it when it's on a slope, right? So what's so special about this up and down motion that we cannot use the same tools that we have used before? Okay, position doesn't stop, so I want to describe this as a 
So yeah, I, I'm not going to try to describe a constant position because that clearly doesn't work. But what I'm going to try to describe here is I'm going to try to describe the position as a function of time. So I recognize it's a function of time. And what I'm trying to tell you is that we have done it before. Like with this card, um, you know, when I give it a little push at the beginning, then its position is changing. But we have tried to, we have successfully described its position as a function of time. And we have done even this. Uh, let me just do this as a reminder. So you might say, okay, that one's different because I set it to move at the beginning. But we have done even something like this, where I place the cart here at rest, and when I let go, it starts to move. Right? Remember seeing all this? Yes? Um, so how would you characterize the motion that you just saw? Like, uh, two, I guess you can describe with a two-word adjective. Anybody, Asia? Yeah, constant acceleration. So we have, um, so you know, that was our first two weeks of the semester. We looked at kinematics, especially ones that deal with the constant acceleration. Does this involve constant acceleration? No. When it's at the equilibrium position, its acceleration is zero. Um, so right now you can see that its acceleration is zero, but even when I pull it down and let go, um, we'll look at it in a bit. Uh, when it's at this position, its acceleration is actually still zero. But you know, when I pull it down and let go, then at this position, its acceleration is clearly not zero, it's upward. And when it reaches up here, its acceleration is downward. So as this oscillates up and down, it involves a changing acceleration. So this doesn't quite work well with any of the tools that we have developed so far, because all those kinematics equations that we derived on the second day of the semester, um, that was for constant acceleration. This is not. That's why we haven't tried to do this description yet. We have sort of uh, nibbled at the edges of it. We try to describe what we can by using conservation of energy. But the problem with the conservation of energy is that it doesn't relate directly to time. So what I'm telling you now is that at this point in the semester, I think we are ready to handle this in the full scale. We are going to go into the actual mathematics and actually, well, actually derive the position as a function of time. But uh, before we go into all of that, because it's going to get calculus heavy. Um, so this and next week is going to be another calculus heavy portion of the semester. But I don't know, in case you are recalling back to how difficult kinematics were, in my opinion, this is actually easier. Because kinematics is um, it's the kind of thing where you thought you understood it when you took calculus. And then you come to this class and you realize that you didn't understand. Those are the, the toughest things to handle. But here, because it looks as complicated, you didn't think you knew it, but turns out a lot of the stuff we are gonna go over today and Thursday are things that you actually know. It's nothing that's radically new.